Our next lecture block is on knowledge. What's the differentiation to semantics? Semantics, by semantics, I understand the individual meaning of a group of symbols. Um, however big that group is, it is always limited in size and purpose. Knowledge re rather refers to the global um, library that we have of understandings of the world in wh that which we live in. So if we consider the central nervous system to be like a sponge that soaks up information from the environment, the knowledge is what we actually know about the world. So it's the ledger of our, no of our knowing of the world. And of course the fundamental question is, of knowledge is where is it in the brain? That is something we are going to deal with, going towards memory patterns or forms of memory. And the second question that we have to ask ourselves, what is it? That going to the world of so-called concept, concept theories. So this is already the, our table of contents for this lecture block. We are dealing with knowledge. When we are dealing with knowledge, we have to answer two questions. First, what is it? That's up here. And secondly, where is it actually stored? That is down here. The block should be somewhere about 20-25 minutes. Um, the fundamental idea is the same as with the image theories. In order to, to understand what I'm looking for in the world of... In the, in, the, in the physical world, I use examples of what philosophers, psychologists, sociologists and other scientists identified over time as truth in their domain and draw analogies to our work of uh, information science in particular, hoping that since, for example, philosophers worked on these problems for 2,500 years, they might have actually by now found all the fundamental possibilities that do exist in their domain. So if their taxonomy is complete and we are able to draw analogies from their world to our world, then we can, in a, w a quick generative way, find a test, quality test, for um, the possibilities in our world, which in this case is the understanding of knowledge as a fundamental ingredient of what we have in the world of um, consciousness and the neural network that we call the brain. So. Sequence is apparently, first we go for the concepts, that is this one here, and secondly, based on that, we go for the memory. Again, as I said, concept is something different than semantics. This is individual, and this is global. Okay? Well then, let's go ahead. I think it's best to introduce you to a notion that is very important for me when I do in the winter term um, my lectures in the field of signal processing, machine learning, um, media understanding, media perception, audiovisual processing, information retrieval, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that is what I call a feature space, or well, not just me what in our domain is called the feature space. The fundamental notion of the feature space is, or the concept is, it's uh, apparently uh, um, a rectangular vector space, so a Hilbert space if you like, in which you can actually measure is that the dimensions are the individual properties 
of the knowledge of the world of the knowledge in which I move. So let's think of um, um, the knowledge domain being classical music, then we or let's rather use pop music. Then one thing we could be interested in is uh, beats per minute, and another one could be loudness. Well, I'm a fan of fast rock music, of punk rock music, and therefore what I want to hear is approximately here. So if I enter that to, um, to an online streaming service, then they will probably know what they have to deliver to me, something with a high root mean square in terms of loudness, it's a high sound pressure, and they have to provide me with something that has a fast rhythm that can also be extracted by simple doing um, linear predictive coding so both very simple features of course feature spaces don't just have two dimensions in the in the technical world nor in the world of the human brain um, they have hundred thousand tens of thousand maybe millions of dimensions um, by which we can distinguish the individual phenomena that we have in a particular sub-world of our world of experience. Here, as we said, it's about experiencing pop music. Okay. Now, you know, my taste is not the only taste. There are people who have a similar taste, for example. They might be around here. Others like it rather slow and not so noisy. Other like noise, but it must not be fast. And there are other groups. As very often in the world, these patterns can be described by, as heaps, and these heaps are often referred to, or are most of the time described by Gaussian processes. Well, we won't go through the details of this from the technical side. Such a feature space could easily be explained and described by so-called Gaussian mixture models. If you're interested in that, go into one of the machine learning lectures of our university, Theovin, or some other online course, other university, and so on. There are tens of thousands of such courses, including mine, of course. Okay, that is not what we are here for. What we are interested in today is what is actually a concept and how can it be explained so what are the theories that help us to explain concepts now then a concept apparently is the result of what we had in the block on the semantics it is exactly this item here back then we said we have words and these words are aggregated into word categories so for example we had running as being a verb and might include the different types of motions forward so it can be kind of defined we might also we also already had house today house meaning uh, going from as we said a skyscraper at the top league um, maybe to even a stadium colosseum going down to a simple simple detached house or a bungalow or even the mud hut of, uh, in a Maasai village. And to, uh, had to enter one of those one time in my life was very impressive. Okay, so concept always includes different phenomena, different forms of semantic knowledge and aggregates them. Why are content, uh, concepts interesting for us? Because building a concept is the fundamental form of semantic enrichment. It is going from what we perceive to reflecting what it actually is, what it actually means. Involving image theories, image theory concepts, and involving concept theories. Having said that, we can explain the major theories of how this is achieved in human beings. This is our central function that allows us to be conscious, actually, can be explained in terms of the feature space. That's why I painted this picture as a preparation for what we are going to do now. Okay, now then, let's go ahead. As we said, 
This is about pop music. Yeah. And in pop music, it's about a number of dimensions, two of them certainly being the beats per minute, so the, the fastness, the speed of the, of the music, and the other one certainly is loudness. And not all people share my view that louder is better. Okay, so how can we describe concepts? Of course, we can easily do it if we have a semantic understanding. Me and my fellows would see this form of music maybe as punk rock. Others might perceive this form of music as maybe soul. Maybe if it's a bit louder, but still not very fast, it might be a very nice blues. And there may be other concepts. So, the concept soul, the concept blues, the concept punk rock is easy for us to derive if we know the dimensions of the feature space, being loudness and the beats. But... What do we mean when we say that? We can, so say the exponents of concept theories, essentially mean one of four or handful of different notions. Of these handful of different notions, two are of paramount importance. One of them is the classical or neoclassical, theory, the other one is prototype theory. So, let's have a look at how they are actually formed, or how they try to explain that we arrive from a number of dots at a concept like punk rock. The, na the, the, the neoclassical theory, as so many other things in this world, go back to the work of the Greek philosophers, again down to Plato, right away. That's why it's called the classical theory, non-surprisingly. And what the Greek philosopher said is a notion that you should be familiar if you had advanced math courses. They say that in order to define a concept, to define what it means to have a house, what it means to run, what it means to have punk music, you need two forms of condition necessary and sufficient conditions. A sufficient condition alone explains you the concept. A necessary condition is one ingredient of a more complex pattern of conditions for describing the phenomenon. So the fundamental idea would be that punk rock is defined as having at least I don't know, 140 beats per minute and having at least a loudness of 90 decibels whatsoever. Okay? And it might actually be open-ended making this condition 90, 140 a sufficient one or it might actually be also limited at the other end and, and there might be on be something like I don't know really death metal acid whatsoever okay so that is the classical theory defining necessary and sufficient conditions it held for 2500 years it is still used today it just and is very logical for describing what the concept actually is it is fully in line with what we what we said in the earlier block necessary condition is then apparently the input of individual elements that were already recognized and if their activation potential is beyond a certain point this is still a neuron then we say the concept is present in the simplest form um, actually there is a threshold if the value is bigger than 140 beats per minute or bigger than 
90 decibels, then we actually go beyond that. So there can be, if you like, be seen a direct analogy between the conditions and the firing patterns of the neurons. That is certainly one aspect of um, such a of, of the uh, neoclassical view that it can be brought in line with certain aspects of neural networks that have been confirmed in the past. Okay, however, it comes along also with a few problems. One problem is that is and that is very important is that the classical theory and also the neoclassical one are impotent or have great difficulties with explaining so-called typicality. Wherever you are, there is a typical car. I live in Europe, the typical car there is the VW Golf. Why is it? Because it is sold way more often than any other car here in Europe. Um, in other parts of the world, it might be the Toyota Corolla or whatsoever. So, we have this understanding, this idea of typicality, because if most of us think of a car, they might think of something. They might think of the Golf, they might think of the of a Porsche, of a, of a of a Ferrari or whatsoever actually but we have this notion of being typical and that is not explained by necessary conditions which, which just define the boundaries of the concept nothing saying about the interior the interior however matters it has a certain topology in a way there is something like a center and there are out, outer parts no? and ends and the ends might be fuzzy from one concept over the other there might be an overlap actually of one concept and and its neighboring one uh, that might actually happen a dispute itself between two concepts okay and a second important problem it's not the only one but it's some um, oh, the second one that i would like to mention is called uh, plato's problem And that was that in the dialogue form that was used for, for transmitting uh, Plato's insights and ideas, um, his students, after he explained them the notion of what actually a concept is, would ask, okay, now please give us the necessary conditions for this and that concept. And whatever Plato would provide, the students and the, would, would, would argue for cases that are, would not be covered by the necessary conditions. That is a problem that we also experience in practice. It is with necessary and sufficient conditions very, very hard or actually impossible to define any semantically relevant category that we have in nature. And therefore, however nice the notion is and however it is in line with what we know of neural networks, it cannot be the complete answer to the problem of how to define concepts as the building blocks of knowledge based on semantics. Um, this cannot be the only answer. By the way, the difference between the classical and the neoclassical theory is mostly one uh, of strictly enforcing the necessary and sufficient conditions and then compromising and blending over them, saying that, okay, for example, a concept can also be a composite of different um, basic properties that we have so introducing so to speak new predicates okay i really don't want to go too far in detail in that if you're interested in that we do it extensively in the lectures on machine learning because if you have experience already you know that there is an equivalent for this notion of necessary conditions in the world of machine learning for example the perceptron is something that works by necessary conditions so the weights implicitly define the necessary conditions so our decision trees obviously so is the support vector machine which tries to separate one concept from another by defining a cleverly laid out margin and many other um, um, classifiers more are that however as we said typically cannot be answered plato's problem cannot be answered and a number of other problems can also be not, not be answered so even though the neoclassical or the classical theory held for a long time it was eventually challenged by other theories and of those the most important one is certainly i think it's fair to say that prototype theory 
So what is prototype theory? One of the major exponents um, who developed it was Eleanor Roche, a very, very famous and very interesting psychologist of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and uh, the prototype theory simply states that we form our concept, just, such as the blues maybe, by giving a typical example, a center point, a centroid. Yeah? And defining a similarity measure or a distance measure, like for example, the L1 norm that we had in the lecture on media and brain one, when we spoke about similarity, generalization, and the like, as the explaining um, mechanisms behind what the neuron is actually doing. So every neuron is semantic enrichment on a small scale. How do we do that? Mostly with the notions of the prototype theory, having a centroid, a typical example, a weight vector, having a distance measure, being able to measure from the center to the outline, and the third ingredient is a threshold. Saying that up to here the concept goes, beyond that point it might be another concept, it might be disputed area as we said here, or it might be um, just a void. Okay, so these three ingredients make a prototype. Would we try to describe the, the concept of blues by a prototype? By a prototype, we might pick as the centroids, I don't know, Sonny Boy Williamson, and um, measuring the threshold, if it's possible, I don't think so, in terms of loudness and beats per minute. We would need more potent um, descriptions here. Thus, being able to eventually come up with that concept. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the prototype theory? One obvious advantage is that the centroid can be picked from reality. I have my understanding of blues, you have your understanding of blues. You like to listen to, to, to Robert Johnson maybe, I like Sonny Boy Williamson, for example, and whatsoever. Then, we might have our individual distance measures. As we spoke about, when we spoke about similarity measures, I told you there is, for example, a gender aspect, a small gender aspect. There is a, different, a deviation between young and old people. Then some are more similarity-based, that means uh, taxonomic, others are more, cement, uh, um, are more uh, taxon uh, thematic, means distance-based, and so on. So that might be a question of taste. And of course our thresholds are different. What happens in particular is that over age obviously we develop new concepts, defining new subcategories, uh, establishing what belongs to the category and what doesn't. Okay, so sum that up. One advantage is that the centroid can be picked from experience, it can therefore become implicit memory, implicit, implicit knowledge, it needn't be something that we have to state and be able to reflect. It is therefore very well able to explain typicality, the prototype theory. Um, another advantage is that it is also in line with other aspects of the neural brain, meaning that the centroid can easily be modeled in weights that are stored in the brain. Thresholds are even better than the thresholds that we have for conditions. The thresholds for the distance function are natural activation thresholds of the neuron. Distance measurement is implicit because it's always a similarity function that we have in the neuron and therefore such a process is certainly there in the brain mechanics and therefore um, in prototype theory use it as a, as a constituent then it is perfectly in line with the neuron. One of the biggest disadvantages on the other end of the prototype theory is that for some categories, in particular complex categories, there simply are no prototypes and therefore prototype theory alone cannot explain and understand. For example, you might have an idea of what 
a typical big European city looks like you know, with an old center and modern outskirts for example um, you might also have an idea of what a small city looks like typically a small city usually doesn't have that big architecture in the center there might be a motorway close by and so on there might be certain properties for that but very few people have uh, actually a, a prototype a centroid for the small European city because there is a wide variation of, of possibilities okay but with necessary conditions it's relatively easy to define that category okay so conclusion from this part is that we actually have um, the classical theory and the prototype theory both of them are very potent being able to explain part of our perception of our building of knowledge both of them are not able to explain all the properties so the almost natural conclusion is that um, that knowledge is a function of both of them and one intriguing example for that in the world of machine learning is the radial basis function a simple classifier modeled on the human brain that in the first step performs um, distance based understanding by by taking the contrast between weights and inputs and in the second level performs a soft match classification kind of with the um, with maximum likelihood which can be related to this uh, condition thing intriguing it is also because the authors as far as i know tried to model their stuff in a rational way but not based on what uh, what was known at the time about concept theories still they came up with such a nice merger between the two concepts okay to conclude on that part in order to be able to arrive from what we perceive to what it might be to knowledge a concept we have to gather um, such phenomena together find to a degree their common conditions and to another degree give a measure for what it should actually be what we expect versus what comes along if we mix those two together we have a rather potent algorithm for recognizing such concepts and the nice thing about it is it's all there in the brain you can actually do it with simple neurons this act of semantic enrichment so if we go back to the table of contents for this block that was it about the concept theories should be a valuable ingredient for your seminar work if you have this concept available then you should be able to understand what is actually in the literature sometimes maybe even as well or even better as the authors themselves understood their brains uh, their, their ideas so second part now that we have to deal with is what is memory or what types of memory do we actually have in order to give you that I'll provide you with a simple taxonomy this is um, from the book of Kandel Schwartz et al um, I hope it's okay to use it it's simple a simple bar chart so there should not be a big copyright issue and it's anyway something that is physical reality and not a creative result okay so what types of memory do we have a very different a very important distinction is that we have procedural or implicit memory and explicit memory explicit is something that we can recall when asked so we have a knowledge of facts you cannot recall everything there is usually an anchoring problem and many other things if you're interested in that you can look into the works of, of Tversky, Kahneman and Slovik for example who did a lot of investigation on that in particular in the economic field and we also have a memory of events of episodes that happens see them as images or even as films in our brains so to sum that up we have a knowledge of events which is um, 
episodic. We have a knowledge of facts. If we can recall that deliberately, it's explicit. And we have many more forms of memory which are implicit. Implicit knowledge might again be procedural. Procedural meaning that it's about movement, about things that happen over time. Temporals, we called them in the last block. Let's put that here maybe. It might actually be learning based. So in the terms of the semiotic scholars, it might be symbolic. It might be something that we actually never reflected in a consciously. That is called habituation, for example. Habituation means that a connection is formed because it turned out useful, for example, evolutionary, and that means. Uh, for example, a flight mechanism, when certain stimuli appear in our perceptive field, we require or required in the old days of our early development to react quickly. And that can be done by the habituation of a connection, of a neural connection between two centers. Okay, yeah, last one here on the list is, is priming, which is form of our configuration for example uh, culturally okay another distinction that is important about memory is whether it is long term all these memories that we just mentioned were long term memories in comparison in contrast we also have um, short term memories Short-term memories appear in different forms. Ultra-short-term memory is the presence of an activation potential in the neuron. Then we had, for example, the slow decay, meaning that um, tonic neurons fire, and there might be also loops of processing on higher levels, for example, if you go over the same problems uh, again and again, so that a certain topic remains in your memory for a day or two, then this is also part of the short-term memory. So what's now apparently the difference between the two concepts of short-term and long-term? The biggest difference between the two is Obviously, from my point of view, this is something that I didn't find in the literature. It might be there, but there is a lot of literature on the memory and, and I'm not sure if I know everything that I should know about it actually, uh, is that long term involves topological change, whereas short term is about information propagation. So it's about chemicals and electrical, whereas the topological side is obviously uh, much more difficult to achieve and also um, much more long-standing, of course. Okay. That is everything that I wanted to say about memory. There is a seminar paper on that, so we will hear a lot about the different types of memory that should be there. I don't want to, to take away the work of, the, of that group, but I hope that um, 
you will provide us some, some interesting insights. The last thing that what I'd like to deal with here in, in this part of the lecture is uh, the question of how to deal with emotions and reflection. That is just a personal pick because it belongs to the field. One fact is that emotions are on one side not very rational. However, they are triggered by experience. If I experience, him, experience something phenomenal, then it ne almost necessarily will also call emotion. These emotions might be rational or not, but mostly they are, they are rather not emotional. Not rational side will might create psychological problems of all sorts that we are not going to discuss here. Okay, and the conclusion that we have to draw is what is the use of emotion? My personal theory is that emotions help us to free resources in the brain. So if we have um, important stimulations, then through the feedback loop of emotions going from the cortex, uh, cortex to the emotional centers and back again might introduce further signals, further stimuli that might be a feedback pattern like a turbo that boosts our thinking to an extent from that evolutionary um, justification it might also just turn into a habit over time so em being emotional might be actually a habit something we get used to over time that we actually learn and that might hinder us as much as it might actually help us as well okay so emotion might be a side effect or might be a contributor to meaning since as we said they're mostly not rational probably their influence on meaning is rather limited but it also of course depends on what sorts of emotions that you actually have now what is reflection reflection means that we become aware of thoughts including emotions what's the use of being reflection it is actually moving from implicit to explicit memory why should that be helpful I personally believe going from implicit memory to explicit memory, memory allows you not just to react on something uh, and live with something, react and deal with phenomena with the outside world to do active planning and goal setting. So if I become aware of my emotions by processing them in my conscious system and we have, we have consciousness in the sensor we are able to make use of what we learned in the past and store it as emotions. Emotions might also be just a fast storage or a storage for, for unsorted, un barely understood elements of our phenomena so so to speak we plow the field of this implicit memory pick out things that might be useful turn out useful for our planning for our activation and turn them from the implicit knowledge 
to explicit knowledge, the tools that can actually be used to master the challenges of our, li of our life more successfully. So that, in my opinion, would be a rational, a rational description of what reflection, and that is apparently a central element of artificial and all sorts of natural consciousness, would actually do to the brain. It is a process that happens on the highest semantic level, um, maybe based on stimuli from the outside world. We try to retrieve all sorts of implicit memory, observe ourselves over the inner screen, pick out those elements that appear interesting, might communicate them to others, others might communicate them to us, so to accelerate and enhance the process. By reflecting them, meaning that taking them from their current categories to categories of another level, by defining conditions, by giving prototypes, by setting the boundaries of what it actually means, making them active, going from one topological structure to another topological structure, uh, physically speaking, forming new centers, more density of neural connections in one area given that one in other area. We actually cultivate what we know and have learned about the world. That, of course, means that we have a higher yield of what we have already stored, making better use of the resources we have in the body. And that combines reflection with emotion, that's why I put the two together, because in this scenario, in this little theory, um, emotions are actually the field on which something grows, it's an uncultivated one, and the reflection is the cultivation. of that field, transforming what we have found out in the past and making it useful for our consciousness. That's why it's so important in the context of this lecture. This is nothing physical. It's not about learning to balance over a rope more elegantly. This is about understanding the fundamental constituents of the world, the concepts, in a better way and thus become able to understand the world better and be more conscious, have a higher consciousness than we actually had before. Okay, let's sum this up. This means creating topology in the brain. It is based on the individual notions of memories that we had before. We had explicit versus implicit. Implicit is what forms our personality, sure, sure. No, no doubt about that. Explicit is, is motivated by uh, the desire to understand the world. We come to motivation in the last block of the Media and Brain 2 lecture. Um, why one should actually want that or why one cannot choose through simply existing that we must want that. So going from implicit to explicit is certainly rewarding for us, if we want it or not. And that means that we plow the field uh, of our emotions and of our unstructured thoughts and put more structure into that. What do, do we do by that? We form concepts by giving conditions and by giving examples, prototypes that can be used to understand the world. And thus we create with concepts from memory, working on that, we create the knowledge that defines us, that defines the world for us, and that enables us to be conscious, con to be conscious beings. in the world. That creates, I think, a small story, a, a small narrative of how we actually store 
and understand the world. Thank you very much.